my general sense of her is absolutely contrary in a kind of way that uh, if you said, well, it looks like rain, she'd say, oh, there's not a drop of rain in that cloud. She was the kind of person, if you said, oh, it's too warm in here, she would immediately go turn up the thermostat uh, and make it a little warmer. She just had a kind of contrary personality. And I think that helped her um, also then say, well, if you say the Maya are peaceful, let's look at them from another point of view. Bit by bit, Tanya began to ask different questions than her colleagues. She also started to study the living Maya, convinced that they had something to teach her as well. When she was in Highlands, Chiapas, she took some lessons learning how to weave on the hand loom that the Maya work with. And at the same time, the same young woman was helping her learn Maya. This is something a lot of people don't know about Tanya, is that she did study Yucatec Maya. Tanya's intuition that the living Maya could provide a valuable link to the past was borne out by a fabulous discovery in 1946. filmmaker named Giles Healy persuaded a Maya Indian to show him one of their secret places. The Indian led Healy to Bonampak, a lost city buried in the jungle. Peering into a building, Healy was astounded to find faces looking back at him from the walls. Armies were locked in a furious battle. Other scenes showed prisoners of war and victims of human sacrifice. Try as Thompson might, it was impossible to convince anyone, I think, that these depicted a peaceful Maya. For in the Bonapak murals, we see one of the greatest battle paintings ever created in the history of humankind. Perskuryakov had not been allowed to write a single interpretive word on the Bonapak paintings, but I've always wondered whether it did not play some role in shaping how she looked at the Maya world. Sir Eric Thompson effectively barred the door at Bonapak preventing other Mayanists from pursuing the bloody implications of its murals. Nevertheless, the flaws were beginning to show in his vision of the peaceful Maya. A few years later, another piece of the puzzle would slide into place. In a bookstore in Mexico, Tanya found a revolutionary new book by a Russian named Yuri Konarsov. Always interested in things Russian, she avidly read his new theory of Maya writing. Eventually, it would prove the key to deciphering the glyphs. But for years, Sir Eric Thompson would condemn the new theory as communist propaganda. In the 1950s, Carnegie closed down its Mesoamerica program, a victim of new priorities. But Tanya was kept on as a research associate with an office at Harvard's Peabody Museum. Her days in the field were over, but her greatest work had just begun. In her little apartment in Cambridge, Tanya was on to something. In reading through Tanya's diaries, I can see that in the 1950s, she made a very conscious decision to become more uh, private in her life. She began working much more intensely with the hieroglyphics. In her mind, Tanya had returned to Piedras Negras, the site of her first experience with the Maya. Puzzling over the monuments, 
she noticed a peculiar pattern in the glyphs. Over and over, the same glyphs were linked to dates. And on each of the monuments, none of the dates exceeded a human lifespan. Suddenly, to Tanya, the evidence was clear. The monuments were marking the stages of an individual's life. Where others had seen only cold calculations, Tanya Praskuryakov saw the lives of human beings. It was a conclusion that cut to the heart of everything Sir Eric Thompson believed. Tanya marshaled her facts, then showed Thompson her article before sending it to the publisher. And when he, she talked with him about it before he had read it, he disagreed strongly with what her ideas of the Maya were. When he took the article home and he read it, he came back the next day and said, well, actually, I believe you're right, which were very big words from someone who was considered a giant in the field at the time. And from that time on, when you saw a Maya monument, you knew that it didn't deal with gods and priests, it dealt with human beings. And that was the importance. In one sense, everything that we've done since then in epigraphy and the interpretation of the hieroglyphs has been a footnote to what Tanya did. She did the general breakthrough. And when she and Yuri Konorosov in Russia uh, came up with the hieroglyphic keys, uh, that was it. We went on a roll. Once the code breakers went to work, a more human image of the Maya began to emerge. Written on the monuments were the stories of their lives, their ancestors, their battles and conquests. Across the centuries, the Maya came alive. Kings and queens, rulers of fabulous cities, full of the voices of people echoing out of the past. Things are changing at such a dramatic rate. We can read about, I would guess, um, 75, 80% of the inscriptions that the Maya wrote. And given that in 1960, we could barely re read any of it, um, that's extraordinary. David Stewart began deciphering Maya glyphs when he was just a boy. Tanya Praskuryakov is one of his heroes. He met her shortly before she died, when she was continuing her careful scholarship at the Peabody. In 1998, Stewart took her ashes to Piedras Negras for burial, at a site high above the ancient city she had loved. We didn't really realize how poignant the ceremony was going to be. Most of us were students or um, young people in the field in our 30s at the oldest. And it sort of dawned on everyone that here was the, you know, the remains of this great lioness, this legendary figure. The Guatemalans who were there were very emotional about this because this was the woman who had brought the Maya back to history. At the end of his pioneering journey to Central America in 1840, the explorer John Lloyd Stevens had been the first to state with conviction. One thing I believe, that its history is graven on its monuments. More than a hundred years later, we finally knew that Stevens was right. At Palenque, Kupan, Chichen Itza, and dozens of ruins in between. The ancient Maya now speak for themselves. <laughs>